Okay. So first, I just want to thank uh, Scott for that great introduction. And uh, I'm sorry I'm not there in person. It's, this is going to be uh, a new adventure for me, which is good. Uh, adventure is one of my core values. So it's different. I've never actually done a webinar presentation of a keynote. And I was already thinking of this as kind of a, a hybrid a keynote and presentation, hence the slides. I'm calling it a keysentation. So uh, for me, when I hear the words Urban Green Infrastructure Summit, it's it's like hearing wood-fired pizza. I just know it's going to be better. Every every single one of those words uh, resonates with me. Although it was funny, I uh, said to my partner a couple of nights ago, when I say Urban Green Infrastructure to you, what does that mean? And uh, I got a very blank look. So it, it's something that I know everyone in this room shares a passion for. And uh, I'm excited to talk about it. You have the screen there? Is that working? Yep. Awesome. So I put this slide in. And it's pretty. It's interesting now that it's in there twice. I put it in twice, and I was trying to figure out last night when I was going through my slides, why did I have the slide in here twice? And I think it's because uh, I didn't know that I was going to get snowed and iced out. And so it's just a good reminder that you don't. Ne you just never really know what it is you're preparing for. And I like to show the slide and give this message when I talk to groups because I often find that there's um, there's always somebody in the room that is either uh, feeling like they're not sure why they're there or they're at the end of their career or they're frustrated with their work. And in those moments where you tend to be kind of the most down, I think uh, is good to remember that you're preparing for something and you just don't know what it is yet. And um, as I talk a little bit about my journey, I'm actually glad that Scott didn't go too deeply into my, my background because uh, one of the things I wanna talk about is just a little bit about uh, my own meandering river a lot of questions that I get when people hear uh, my background. The first question they ask me is, how did you get to Oregon from Texas? And then when they know I work for the city, they want to know how I became an irrigation specialist and then an assistant city manager. So a little bit about just me and my, I'm not going to do a ton of this, but I think it's important as leaders that we are authentic and vulnerable. Uh, that's how we build our relationships with each other in this room and it's also how we build relationships in the community and that's typically uh, to me the cornerstone of how we get things done so uh, i grew up in in texas and you can see that i did a lot of things in the outdoors i had a very early uh, love of water and all things outside in fact i quit like even though I was um, really recruited in my school to play volleyball and basketball because I was the tallest kid, I wouldn't play in a gym. I wanted to be out on the field. So I was the youngest of three kids. Uh, there was a significant age gap between me and my my oldest sister. And so I spent, I spent a lot of time alone and a lot of time uh, work with adults in settings where, where I was always the youngest. And so for me, being outside and playing and making up games and building forts was really a part of my essence. And I think uh, brought me a lot of safety and peace as a kid, which I know is also a place of privilege for me because I meet people all the time that uh, being outdoors was never a safe place for them. And so that's you know part of what I always remember when I talk about this. Um, but even with all of this great outdoor experience as a kid, my parents weren't exactly uh, what I would consider to be stewards of the environment. They they like to hunt and they like to fish. And I think to the extent that uh, you joined Ducks Unlimited to protect the land that you hunted on, they were they were really strong in that. But um, both of them were geologists. They worked in the oil and gas industry, uh, basically drilling wells. So the they both, not so much my mother, but my father definitely had a very anti-regulatory mindset. So I know that it, would, it was just his pride and joy when I decided to uh, work for local government. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm back to the slide and I, uh, I, we can have a little bit of an interaction here. I'm curious if anybody knows what river this is, just while we're going along the way. Um, you can just like type it in and win a prize. So Anybody? I think about uh, careers in kind of a, in a meandering uh, format. I did like the minute I was able to leave Texas, I had a driver's license and a high school degree. I went as far east as I could. I went all the way to North Carolina and uh, went to school 
at Duke and wanted to study cultural anthropology, which was a huge, you know, my parents were like, what is that? And I was really interested in, in people and how humans and people and language and systems all work together and just kind of that messiness. I, I just embraced it. Uh, one of the things I did early on was I, I wrote a paper. I found it not that long ago. I don't have very many things from my my past, but I have this thing. I wrote a paper on how college sports uh, take advantage of of young athletes, in particular uh, athletes of color. And I, I didn't even remember writing it, but I do remember that it wasn't popular uh, to a football loving Texas family, that that's what I was studying in college. But I uh, just did that for a little while and then ended up um, really missing the Western sky. So I, I went to Colorado State University I was going to be a forester, like the ranger kind of forester, not an urban forester. Uh, but I quickly switched over into landscape horticulture, horticulture because I really did see that the trees in the cities were really uh, what I was passionate about. I was passionate about neighborhoods. I was passionate about green things that I saw every day when I was walking to school and just got very passionate about that. And that's kind of like, I think, the beginning of uh, when I really started to know who I was going to be. So I'm not going to go into a ton more detail, but I um, ended up in Seattle because that's where all the great nurseries were happening. I thought I was going to gr grow trees, um, but ended up doing a lot of landscape construction, irrigation construction. Along the way, I, uh, when I was in Fort Collins, I taught myself how to do irrigation because I worked for a landscape contractor that we always subcontracted an irrigation person to come do the work. And I realized he's making a lot more money than we were and there a lot less time. So I went and think about this, like during the time it was the eighties, I, I got every pamphlet I could from Toro and Rainbird and Hunter. I studied, you know, hydro, I just studied everything until I figured out how to do it, which is important because that's actually how I got hired at the city of Eugene. Not any, I, it could have been college education, but I still think it's because I learned how to do irrigation and was pretty good at it. Um, so I came to Eugene uh, to study landscape architecture. So it was my second degree. And uh, I'm often asked by people now that I'm in this role, if I miss being a landscape architect and why I don't use my landscape architecture. And, and my answer to that is always, I use it every day. Um, when I came to the University of Oregon, I learned how to think and I learned how to see people and the environment together in a way that I had never really understood. And I think back on some of those early projects, like I, my first like studio we worked on was a, was a neighborhood design competition. So it was a neighborhood park. It was a design competition for a, for an uh, area in the Chicago, kind of Chicago neighborhood. And I remember the professor saying, well, you need to look, you know, kind of outside the boundaries. Like, what about like a block out and two blocks out? And I was thinking, wow, why would I look out that far? And by the time I graduated, one of my final projects was actually a proposal to do these tangential lines of trees all the way across the state of Oregon. Uh, and it, it all lined up. It was a pretty interesting project. But it, you know, I, I even was looking out at a global, like, how could you just keep this row of trees going all the way around the world? And so I think you do really start to think about things in a bigger perspective. And since I've been at the city, I've done a lot of work. I went on to get my master's in organizational leadership and uh, trained as an executive coach. So the rest of kind of what I'm going to talk about today is really going to be a mashup of all of that. And um, hoping that as I talk about it, that you'll find ways to connect with this kind of personally in your own leadership development. And you'll also find a way to connect, you know, work projects to it as well. I'm going to give a couple of Eugene examples we can talk through in more detail. <coughs> Tons of time to ask questions if you want to. So um, in the work that I did around executive coaching, I was introduced to this intentional change theory by Richard Boyatzis. And it's actually not really very different than collective impact. You're going to have some, you're going to talk about that a little bit later today, but this is really just how do people change? So I'm going to interchange, I'm going to use this diagram and some of the terminology, but I think you can really interchange self with project or initiative. Um, and, I, and I'm always trying to simplify this down for people. In fact, I'm going to just jump a slide ahead. I often tell people that it's, as simple as adding one plus X equals two. One plus X equals two is really, you know, you start off knowing either 
your your real self or your real project, your real conditions, or you know your ideal self, your ideal conditions. Usually people will start in one of those places. They're either like if you're if you're coming to me for leadership coaching, you're you've either been told that you're uh, difficult to work with or you're you need to grow a certain skill and so you're you've gotten very in touch with who you really are or or you're coming because you see that you want to promote and you have an ideal self and you don't know how to get there projects are kind of the same way um, but usually once you have those two things and you know what that gap is you have your agenda or your strategic plan and then the key element here that I think is really different than a lot of others is this idea of experimenting and I, this is to me where where real change happens, it's it's not in big, massive, massive change. It's in, in small experiments. So, for example, um, I'm going to give you some examples from a work context a little bit, but the from a personal context, I've had uh, two examples. One being somebody that really wanted to spend more time exercising and kind of working on their work-life balance. And we just kind of kept working through how are we gonna how are you gonna make time to go to the gym? How are you gonna go to the gym? And and she never would go to the gym. And so uh, one of the experiments I set up for her was, well, how about if we just do this? How about every day you you're gonna spend 30 minutes on your couch in your living room? Didn't even tell her what it was about, but it was that was so easy to do. So for a week, two weeks, you just notice like, yeah, it was really easy to do. I spent 30 minutes on my couch. I'm like, okay, so it's actually not a time issue. You can set 30 minutes of time to be on your couch. You can spend 30 minutes time doing something else. But that awareness helps people be able to grow. Um, so also, I think, oh, I'll just move on here. So I, um, when I talk about leadership, I often say, I remember when I first learned to cook, I the most thing I was the most excited about was I went and bought this. Um, you guys probably have done this. One of those sets of... Uh, spices that you get all the crazy spices that you never actually use but you look for recipes where you can use all of them well when you're really a good cook you really actually just need salt and pepper and this is really true of leadership too uh, one plus x equals two it's not a complicated formula you know where you want to go you know where you are today and you just kind of need to fill in the blank the key here with the parenthesis is that um, is that you have that supportive relationships and that uh, I skipped over in the last one but the one of the things we do as leaders and we do in the community is we hold space for people to have conversations so that's why I like this parenthesis is because it just if, if you were looking at me now you would see me with my hands apart just kind of holding holding space holding people making it safe for people to have a relationship and um, you know when you're working on your own stuff you also need supportive relationships to get to get those things done. So I'm gonna talk about how that played out in a really significant way in Eugene. Um, so we went through, uh, you know, Eugene's known for having some controversy around growth. And we, over the last 11 years, have been going through uh, an update to our comprehensive plan to update our urban growth boundary. So if you're from Eugene Springfield, you may know all this, but the legislature actually in 2007 took action and said Eugene and Springfield had to split their urban growth boundary and we used to share one. And that's kind of what initiated all of this. Initiate started very politically motivated. Um, a lot of push by the home builders to do that because they felt if they could divide the two cities apart, then Springfield would be able to grow as they wanted to and, and they could continue to work on Eugene. So it set off this um, kind of long process. We'd never moved our urban growth boundary before. And when our city manager came to Eugene, uh, I think everyone told him it'll never happen. You're gonna do all this work, but you'll never be able to move it. So we started with this relationship and he said, we're gonna do it different. And we did it really different. And we, uh, we basically kind of came up with this list of 65 to 75 community leaders and, and not like when I say community leaders, I really mean influencers. These aren't CEOs. Some of them were CEOs, but a lot of them were just people from the neighborhoods that were pretty well known in the community. And we invited them all to a very different kind of group. So we invited them and asked them if they would be willing to invest two and a half days with us, full two and a half days to really dive into uh, what it meant for Eugene to grow 
and we brought in a facilitator and I, I hate to even call him that. We worked with somebody named Bob Chadwick. And if um, I'd be looking for a show of hands, if is there anybody in the room that has ever actually worked with Bob Chadwick? That's not a city of Eugene employee. We're not I'm seeing not any there. hands. Nope. Okay. So Bob was somebody that our city manager had known from uh, some time. He had, he had done some work in Fort Collins and actually what he's, what he's best known for was he, he brought together the, the tribes and the agriculture and urban interests in the Klamath Basin. And he's uh, kind of has this consensus model of conversation that is very, very, very different. And um, unfortunately he passed away a couple of years ago from pancreatic cancer, it was really tragic. But he, he was kind of a unicorn. And he, what happened in this space was, was truly spiritual from, um, from a leadership standpoint. We brought these 65 people into a room and we held the space when I, we really did hold it. So we had it, we did it in a, a church that's downtown and we had 65 chairs in a circle. And that was kind of Bob saying, you all, you're always in a circle. And we started the day doing a greeting circle where we you literally like walked around the circle and looked every person in the eye, held, you know, shook their hand and just kind of got to know each other a little bit. And then we did um, the next thing, which I think is an, would be an interesting exercise for some of you to do today as you're thinking about net, networking, is Bob had this thing about three by five cards and best and worst outcomes. So everybody in the room was, was asked to kind of uh, write on a three by five card, what is the worst possible outcome of uh, talking about how we want to grow together? It was a question something like that. And you go around the circle and everybody shares their, you know, the worst possible outcome. And by the time you've gone through 65 people, it's, it takes a little while and it's also super bummer. I mean, you just heard 65 worst outcomes and it's like, oh God, this isn't going to be fun. And then uh, he has you flip the card over, you write the best possible outcome and we do the same thing and you go in reverse. And there's a, there's a psychology to that. That, that is about um, putting your worst outcome out there and giving it a voice actually takes a lot of energy out of it. And it allows you to shift your energy to moving in a positive direction. So we took all those best possible outcomes and we put them into a collective statement and they actually carried through into our um, vision plan. Like when you go through our, our first 2012 draft, you'll see best outcomes on every section that's in there. And then the other thing we did, and that's the image up on the board, is we put maps out on the table. We mixed people up. People didn't know each other. So we had like the Home Builders Association. We had a thousand friends. We had our neighborhood associations. We had business leaders, schools, just kind of a random assortment of people. We put them at tables and we had every table had a big map of Eugene and we literally gave them hearts. So we had lots of different kinds of stickers and markers, but we had hearts and people were at, we asked people to, to talk about the things they really loved about Eugene. And it was amazing to just watch people uh, light up and put the hearts down and talk about why those places mattered. And, and at that time I had lived in Eugene for a long time and hearts were put down in places. I had no idea what, what they were talking about. And it really allowed people to kind of bond and connect. And then Bob did another thing, which was, uh, he really he taught us how to listen and i i thought i knew how to listen and i really felt like like most people it's if i'm not talking i'm listening but he actually uh did a lot of exercises where we would sit like a couple of people would sit in the middle of the circle so for example if you took the president of the home builders and you took um the staff person from thousand friends and they would share their perspective and they'd talk for two or three minutes and then the person would have to basically say, here's what I heard you say. And everybody would listen to these interactions and they were they were pretty emotional and people were very vulnerable. It was the most authentic experience I've ever been in. And it, it really, I think, changed the trajectory of Eugene. Um, so that, you know, that work was made it really easy to come up with our plan, which was, you know, how we're gonna grow over the next 20 years. We did all this work prior to um, the implementation of actually starting to do the code revisions and, and moving the urban growth boundary. But those 
relationships made it really easy to build an ideal view, an ideal vision, and it set these things up and we were off to a great start. Which is why uh, most people were surprised when we started to do the implementation that it just wasn't working. And I think that's a lot of why I think Scott was asking me to come today is like, what do you do when you have these great visions and everybody agrees and then you go out into a neighborhood and you try to make them happen and they get stopped. So I was like going down this warm and fuzzy train here and I know that's probably what you were hoping for here, but um, I think I and other people were definitely in this. Seriously, did this, did this just happen? I think we all just agreed to this. Uh, from a leadership standpoint, uh, one of the things that was really important for me and for John was to maintain a, a lot of optimism about this. So one of the things I did with a staff member, we had one staff member who'd worked for years on single family code amendments, years, and worked with neighborhoods, had gone through the planning commission, had a solid consensus vote coming out of the planning com commission, and then we went to the city council and they they stopped the work and they and they stopped it because we had a few people in the community that understood um, they knew when when to play their power cards and they played them at that time and it and it stopped the work and so uh, <laughs> we did a, a speaking of wood fire one of the things i did with her which was really fun was we had a bonfire the night of the council meeting so the night that the council tanked it we went to uh, we went to one of our co-workers backyards we built a bonfire and had a playlist of music about fire and we burned through some of the most painful code amendment pieces and just kind of processed that so that kind of interaction with staff can keep people really um, going and then we also on a on a broader level we brought back the CRG and this was after so that group that we pulled together for two and a half days committed to two and a half days but they spent more than 20 full days with us it just kept going and going and going and going we'd get back together for a day so here we are several years later we got them back to talk about how do we move this forward we thought we all agreed and uh so here's the we we found ourselves in in what people call the drama triangle this is not the drama triangle uh, the drama triangle is, is kind of the opposite of this. It's you know, people, when they're under stress, tend to go into a place of being a victim or an attacker or a martyr. And teams that are the healthiest and most productive uh, do the opposite of that. And they maintain an openness, resourcefulness, persistence. And I think that's something that when you're doing the kind of work that we're doing and that you're doing in the room, um, it's important to remember because sometimes problems just seem like they're impossible and you just can't solve them. But you have to just kind of keep searching for more information, stay curious and uh, keep learning and adapting to the situation that's at hand. So I'm gonna go back to this because this, I'm, you know, we we're still trying to figure out what, what went wrong. And how is it that we had all of this? We had our real ourselves. We had an action plan. We knew who we ideally wanted to be. You know, what what could we have done different? So the, you know, earlier I showed you one plus X equals two, just because I was trying to keep it simple. But doing something like an Envision Eugene plan where you're moving the UGB is, is more like a 13, lucky 13 or unlucky 13. I don't know if you know, if you Google the number 13, it'll say, why is the number 13 lucky? And if you the next one down is like, why is number 13 unlucky? So I'm not exactly sure if it's lucky or unlucky, but it's bigger than a two. Um, and that's, you know, usually when people solve this problem, they put a 12 in there. So, and this is true in, in leadership development too. When you have your ideal self and you know who you want to be, you want to take that big leap, you want to get there. But, uh, and that's what people tend to think of as transformation. So when I, said I was gonna talk about leading change and transformation. People tend to think of transformation being a kind of a one-time big deal, like everybody notices it, we've transformed, we're a better person, we're a better city, we have more green infrastructure, you know, whatever the thing is. But there's other ways to get to that transformation. I think this is where uh, the real work is, and that is in, in you know, kind of busting it up into smaller increments. Real change, real sustained change doesn't happen in those one plus 12 moments. It happens in a one plus one plus two, and you might build up to a four, and then you may have to go back to a one. 
I'm curious how many people in the room have checked my math on this. <laughs> and who hasn't checked my math? There's got to be somebody who's like, oh, I didn't even think to check the math. That's, that's my person. I checked it. I checked it like five times. <laughs> so I'm going to give an example of, an, of another project in Eugene where I feel like we tried to take a, a 12 size bite of something. And it's around, and we've had a lot of things happening in, in the South Willamette area of Eugene. And it's, it's from a planning perspective, from a staff perspective, I think we, we always, I think we kind of lean towards wanting to do projects in South Eugene because it is typically like it, it has typically been the more progressive part of our community, the more a lot of university faculty and students live there. Um, you know, if you look at how we vote, most of the measures in Eugene that are, in fact, every single measure that's passed in Eugene uh, passes if South Eugene votes for it. So even if no, nobody else wants it, if South Eugene wants it, it usually happens. So it's, and it's also where, you know, you hear the strongest um, about climate recovery here. It just, it just in, tends to be progressive. And so I think um, we can sometimes take for granted that that it's also their neighborhood and they're gonna have some of the same livability concerns as everybody else. So South Willamette Street, we had a zoning process I can talk about if you wanna know more details, but we wanted to rebuild the street. And it's, a, it's kind of a major corridor in South Eugene. It's a, it's a major corridor identified in the Envision Eugene plan. And it um, had really pretty bad conditions. So this photo, you can kind of tell, like you, it's four lanes, there's no bike lane. There's no turn lane. Uh, the sidewalk is kind of riddled with, with utility poles and the sidewalks right up against the street. People drive pretty fast. And so I just, this is, um, you can kind of get another sense here. You, this was actually under some level of construction. So it's not quite as bad or as many people. But this is actually like, this is classic South Willamette before any kind of project happened. You just didn't want to walk on it or bike on it. In fact, the best days on South Willamette are snow days because it would essentially turn into one of those kind of Sunday street projects where there's no cars and the streets filled with people. So it seems like uh, we came forward with a proposal to um, narrow the street, not narrow it physically. So curb to curb would stay the same, but we were going to put bike lanes on both sides in a middle turn lane and have travel lanes going each direction. So instead of four lanes, it'd be three lanes and you'd have bike lanes on either side. Much more comfortable environment for walking, much more comfortable environment for biking. And all of the data and all of the um, modeling showed that there'd be really no impact to any of the travel flows. Um, but we didn't, we got a lot of pushback. I mean, a lot of pushback. And in fact, some of the strongest pushback was from our own team. So the fire department in particular, even the fire union came out pretty strongly against us saying there's no way we were gonna slow down time, it wasn't gonna happen. So we were kind of finding ourselves back in that same position where a, something that makes sense, it is aligned with a vision, is about to be stopped, stalled, or just uh, not quite scrubbed, but stopped or stalled. And so we came up with an idea of doing what I think is a plus one or plus two or plus three. So instead of taking off the whole project, we said, hey, what if we just test it? I love that word, um, experiment and testing, because people feel like they're willing to kind of take that risk. So what we basically did was um, proposed a test where we would paint temporary lines and test it for a year. So we would take it down to three lanes, add the middle travel lane, um, and give it a full year. And the reason why the full year was important was we, from a transportation planning perspective, people were really concerned that uh, it would just bomb out if we only did it for a month or two months because people would never adjust. So we needed time for people to adjust their behaviors. We needed time to collect actual data. And we needed, um, we needed time to adjust the system because, you know, our traffic engineers are kind of watching the timing of the lights. Uh, and one thing we did when we did this, which I think was really smart, was we said, we're going to test it, but we actually do need to put in this one signal. And you can kind of see right, right in the middle of the screen. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but there's a, 
you can see where we added a traffic signal and a three-way stop. So that we actually started to construct the project even though we said we were we were testing it. And uh, you know what we've discovered is that it, it works, and it's been kind of amazing the way uh, it works. The I think the most significant voice at the table has been the fire department and the fire chief saying, actually, we've had no problems. It works fine. There's been no issues with LTD. Uh, there's more people out riding bikes. There's people you see people on the sidewalks, you see people in the bike lanes. Traffic hasn't been slowed more than a few seconds. Uh, the people thought that it would push traffic into the neighboring streets and ramp ramp up those numbers. That hasn't happened. Uh, it's just working. So it's it's one of those ones where I think it was a little bit of a, a smaller bite and it built a lot of confidence and people felt like we were listening to them. And so I think it's examples like that where, um, it's examples like that where you can kind of take a big project and kind of break it down. You can probably break it down even further. So, um, you know, so like I know there's a mix of people in the room, and so I wanted to just talk about kind of what everyone can do when we when we when we're looking at this model and we're thinking about change and we're thinking about the projects that are out there. Uh, I think it is really important that we're able to work together. Um, you know, I talked about the three by five cards. My challenge to you is, I know networking. Whenever someone says you're going to network, even the most extroverted people seem to hate networking. So you could even do a little test with yourself where you write worst possible outcome of networking today and tonight and then flip it over or just use a little small piece of paper, best possible outcome. And I, I guarantee you'll have a better situation. But I think um, one of the ways that uh, we can work together is creating this diversity of relationships. And uh, somebody earlier talked about teams. It's sometimes hard to think about how you're a team when you're working remotely. Uh, in different disciplines. But I do think that one of the things that we've struggled with in Eugene, and I think other communities too, is uh, trust is based, you know, the, the basic core element of trust is built on understanding somebody's intent. And if you trust, if you don't trust their intent, then it's hard to come to the table and be an open collaborative partner. Um, and so there's people that have a lot more trust in the intent of an extension service there's or a university or community college in particular I think um, in Eugene Link Community College might be the most trusted people distrust them whereas they may have a different feeling about the intent of a local government employee especially if you're in a regulatory framework um, you know, one of the things I've learned about the the South Willamette project we're doing another two-way bikeway on a on a road in South Eugene uh, we, this summer. And people have been kind of coming out against that one too because we're removing parking. And I met with one of the neighborhood leaders um, last week and she shared with me in that conversation that she believed that we were putting the bikeway in and then we were gonna rezone all the single family residences along that street to be uh, apartments. Like And so they're fighting the bike lane because they think that's what our actual intent is. Our intent is to get the bike lane in and be like, oh, look, we have this great bike lane. Let's put in apartments, which is not the intent at all. But I think that's why I think different people can bring people to the table and that supportive relationship piece in the center. Um, I also think that it's really important on each of these things to understand uh, the real self. So from an academic perspective, I think helping us understand the real problems we're trying to solve and breaking it down in ways that people can really understand and tell a simple story like this, you know, this is what's happening in our community or this is what's happening in this, you know, watershed and in a really simple way. But having the data and the facts that back it up, I think is something that we're not able to do at the, at the depth that you are. And we need that work. We need that work done. Um, I think also helping understand, I think uh, from an academic perspective, uh, people that are doing research tend to understand experiments and kind of making incremental progress and testing things. And I think helping um, figure out how you can kind of break these problems down into smaller tests and experiments and then how we share that information around the network. Uh, we're always looking, I think other people are, 
we were doing a, I had this grand plan when I was in planning and development that I was going to, I thought downtown should be smoke free. I was like, well, what if we just have the best smoke free downtown in, in the country? Like, wouldn't that just draw people here? Wouldn't you want to live in a place where you could just go downtown and it would be smoke free? That seems cool. And we have a, the number one um, thing that's killing people in our community is smoking. So it, it made a lot of sense. But it's, um, it was, it was hard to do. And, and I, we pulled in a researcher and a consultant and who does a lot of work in public health. And I said, well, who's doing this? Who's doing this? Like, give us an example. And she, and she said, the problem is Eugene's usually at the forefront of these things. And there's nobody else to grab from. In this case, people have passed us up so we can. But I think we were like the first city, maybe the first city in the country that had an indoor smoke-free ordinance. So it, it is, I think when we're in Oregon and we're doing work around urban green infrastructure and sustainability and social equity, we tend to be kind of at the front of the pack. And so between us, I think being able to share stories of experiments that have worked and how people embraced it so people can build some trust and not feel like something's so big is really helpful. Um, and I think all of us need to think about how we can slow down and especially with the relationships and be uh, really take the time. We're, we're doing some work right now with our city council. Usually every year we do some goal setting and they get together and talk about, you know, kind of where they want to focus their attention. Well, last a couple of weeks, we, we have one this weekend and we have one a couple of weeks ago and uh, the facilitator did a really good job of basically saying, okay, here's the things you all feel really good about how that you got accomplished. What we're going to do today is we're just going to break down what were the key elements of that success from a from the city council's perspective. And I kind of came up with this total metaphor like of a crock pot. And that's really what we heard. The things that actually went really well in this community that they feel really good about are places where um, they felt like they had a really clear defined role in the beginning. They understood and the purpose that had been fully vetted kind of with the community. And we took our time with the relationships. We brought them kind of iterative work sessions. So we communicated well, and they just, those are the places where they felt really good. And I think we tend to try to hurry things up a little bit, try to work off the radar sometimes. And I, and I think that ends up uh, being problematic. So I think if all of us can just kind of slow down a little bit, uh, be and be authentic and vulnerable and that's you know really why I start off the slide showing you ridiculous pictures of me swimming in a lake with water moccasins probably but it's just so you know that we're all real people and uh, have things we want to do so you know this uh, image of Eugene is kind of one of my favorites one of my favorite things to do in Eugene is go up to the top of Skinner Butte which is this was actually taken from a drone on the top of Skinner Butte but I like to go up there and be able to look across the city because that's really when you realize why we do what we do. You see the ridge line, you see the river, you see all the trees, the canopy, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of humans in there too. I mean, it's really like a place where um, the landscape architecture and the cultural anthropology kind of come together. And to me, there's a, there's a lot of power when you, when you get to those oxbows in your life where like you've been on this kind of long meandering path and you're not sure where you're going and all of a sudden you find yourself back at like, oh, this is actually what I intended to do all along. And there's a lot of power in that. Um, I put the heart there because I think, you know, it's, it's not just, I don't just invite you to bring your heart to work and to this room, but I, I think it's needed. And so it's not just okay, it's actually pretty urgent to do that. And sometimes that can be really hard because if you bring your heart, uh, sometimes it's hard to have a passion and bring all that and not also bring an agenda. And I, I find where people are the most resilient and getting the most done is where they have a really strong passion, but they don't actually have an agenda. And I mean, I just mean like, um, you, there's many ways to get to feed that passion and not just one way. And the agenda always feels like it's kind of one way. And being together, so the uh, there's a study that was done by Stanford not that long ago, but it's I refer to it all the time about the power of the word togetherness and doing things together. And they they did this research project where they separated people into 
to two different groups and they told one group, hey, you guys, we're going to separate you. You're going to be working on this puzzle, but you're going to you're going to be working on it kind of together. We're, you're going to be alone in the room, but we're going to send in clues from your team. And I'm probably grossly um, summarizing this. They took the other group and they said, OK, you guys are going to solve the puzzle. We're going to put you in the room. One of our researchers is going to come in and give you clues along the way. And what they learned from that study was that the people they and then what they did was they put them in individual rooms and they took them exactly the same clues in exactly the same way. They didn't say your teammate brought it. They just brought them in exactly the same way. Nothing was different except that the one group believed that they were working together on a difficult problem. And the statistics in that were that they persisted like up to 65% longer on the task. They had a lot more interest in it. They tested them for their tiredness. They were far less tired and they were really engrossed in the task and performed better on it. And that to me is just, um, for me, the 2018, I said my, my intentional word for the year is together because I really do think that we have a lot of difficult things out there that we're working on. Some of them seem like they're endless and we can't solve them. Um, for us in this community, it's, it's around homelessness um, on one end of the spectrum. And then it's also about, you know, the other problems that go with that are poverty and, and housing affordability and equity in neighborhoods and, you know, all the things that are, that are tied up and kind of the reasons why the work that we're doing around providing a green infrastructure is so important. So I just encourage that. And that is kind of the end. And I can uh, share other stories. I can answer questions. I just want to thank you for the time and being allowed to do this. I'm sure it was a little bit awkward not having me in the room. Uh, this is my contact information. I said in sometimes here on the Twitter because I saw that you guys are doing Twitter. Twitter. And I used to do it all the time. And then I just, I, I, I think it might be <laughs> the current tenor of Twitter that has driven me away. Just like, ah, uh, I don't want to be bombarded with politics constantly. That so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Are there any questions for Sarah while we have her? And I think she'll be able to hear you if you use the microphone. So I want to make sure. I don't see any questions, but uh, I'll definitely be um, uh, reiterating many of the themes I heard in your uh, talk, Sarah. So thank you again. OK, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. thing here. Um, seriously, so I don't know if Sarah is still on there, but I think as we sort of make transition into our next session, I guess I thought Sarah did a really good job. Um, what I thought is to help reframe what the summit is about, hopefully that we'll get to is really the side of how do we get to the 12s in each of our communities? And I think that's what, we're, what we were striving at and planning to be putting this together is by bringing you together you know, in areas across disciplines is sort of how do we get to the 12s? How do we help you get to 12s in the community from a university perspective for realizing how you gain to those 12s can occur at the landscape level, this traditional stormwater management standpoint, but also those non-water opportunities, air quality, equity, right? Those are all things that I think I got out of Sarah's talk of how do you think about what maybe is traditionally pipes and pumps, I believe, when they talk about stormwater. I'm not a stormwater expert. Um, but the reality being how do you envision what the outcome can be for your communities and use different tools to get there. And so I think that will be um, important. And as you look at the questions you want to be thinking about going into the breakout, it is sort of that. The stories that work for you and your communities, the challenges you face, partners you have, the partners we need, 
just sort of been trying to think about putting all that together. So um, again, I think Sarah did a great job of framing where we want to get to through the next day and a half and how do we set that up. And one of the things I did mention in my introduction is sort of also the session four that we talked about sort of optional is really um, going to build even further for those, those who are more in the academic or kind of applied research side is once we've been listening to everything we've been talking about for a day and a half, how do we start framing those into uh, questions that could be tackled through research proposals and research projects so we can start trying to generate the revenue that's probably needed to support a lot of this work. So that's sort of where we're going with and why participation today and tomorrow will be critical to help us, all of us, get the right information to move things forward. So, um, were there other questions or comments based on this? Thoughts? Yes, I'm um, curious about the Sarah. Sarah, are you still, are you still on the uh, yeah. meeting? Yeah, I'm still on. I can't hear the question, so if you could just repeat it to me. Okay, so this is. Uh, I have a question about, you showed um, the slowdown or the change in your vision um, and you had those newspaper headlines showing that the city council vision didn't take. Can you very briefly give us a reason or a few reasons why, because I think that happens pretty often where you know, planning processes kind of break down um, and potentially ways you might get around that. Um, yeah, so the ones that have typically broken down for us are um, any place where we are increasing any kind of density, even if it's minimal. So the there's two things going on. Um, what happens is that there's, when I say there's two things going on, there's, um, there's a definite group of, and it's pretty small, I think. There's a, there's a smallish group of pretty active community members that have a lot of distrust in city staff and think that city staff have an agenda um, to push through uh, growth in neighborhoods. And it's, it's kind of a long-standing um, neighborhood piece, and which is super interesting because all of our staff live in neighborhoods. Most of them live in Eugene and the neighborhoods that are, that are kind of fighting the most um, and have just as much investment in them, but there's there's a fear, and so it it's um, always like it's like you can't trust the messages, you can't trust the proposal that the city staff are putting forward. We have a better one, and then the proposal that will come forward usually is something that is going to try to keep the single family character of the neighborhood as much as possible, which is comp you know completely understandable on one hand. It's just when you're trying to figure out, okay, well, we have to we have to have people go someplace. The you know group had kind of decided we don't want to we actually don't want to expand the urban growth boundary for for certain things. So multifamily housing was one of them. Nobody wanted in that community resource group to expand for that. So you have to figure out where it's going to go in Eugene, which is used downtown or on the corridors. So it it breaks down because the group of community members will. Um, kind of hijack the process somewhere in the middle and start just feeding negative information, negative information, and they'll and they just get nervous. It's their constituents, and so they you kind of have to go back and we go through all the same information. The the one that was the most significant here, the single family one I was talking about, was one that would have allowed secondary dwelling units, and we were only planning over the twenty year plan to have like a hundred of these. So when you think about 20 years of growth, 100 of these, and they were only going to be um, in the way we were planning them. They could only be in very certain locations. They had to have access off a street or off an alley. They couldn't be deep in the block. It was really pretty, um, it was pretty tight in order to secure, to maintain that neighborhood livability, but it, it got stopped. And what was really interesting is that one of our city councilors, literally within weeks, we were having, John and I were having breakfast with him. And he said, hey, I've been talking to this guy that builds tiny houses and wants to do them in backyards. Like, we should talk about doing these in backyards. And I, I literally looked at him. I was like, you, 
are you're kidding? Like you just voted no to this. And he's like, yeah, yeah, but I think we're going to be ready to take this back up again. And they actually are going to take it back up again. It's taken some time, but I think it's sometimes they just have to respond to their constituents and then adjust. I think we could have done it in smaller increments and it wouldn't have been as big of a deal. So for example, if we had just said, we're going to test it in this one area, I think that would have been better than saying, um, we're going to do it citywide. So, and what we've found is actually some of the areas that are um, the most open to it aren't in South Eugene. They're in areas that are typically underserved and are dying to have the city put some infrastructure in and to help them grow. So I think we learned a lesson about our assumptions. Um, so that answer that? I think I've yes. lost your. You know, okay. I put us on mute. Yes, that did answer the question. So, um, and I don't okay. see any others. And I think we're on a spot to kind of move us to keep us on our modified agenda to be. All right. Thank you. Moving on. So thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah. Have a good couple of days.